from the streets of New York City, Porkins Policy Radio. Here's Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here live every Tuesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern by tuning into ocelli.com. Of course, you can also find the show archived on my website, which is porkinspolicyreview.com. If you are new to the show, there are lots of ways to listen. You can, of course, uh, listen live. You can follow the RSS feed directly on my website. You can subscribe on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, Player FM, Podbean. Uh, pretty much all major and minor podcatchers will have the feed. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel, if uh, that is your preferred method. And uh, on Friday nights, I am replayed on a host of other networks, including uh, Awake Radio and uh, People's Internet Radio. Uh, and that is, uh, I believe, my uh, my time slot is something like 11 to – or 10 to midnight, something like that. I should know better. I'll have to ask uh, – re- remind Ed to tell me. And um, also, uh, you can – Listen to the show on Ed Opperman's Spreaker channel as well as Chuck Ocelli's Spreaker channel. So uh, <laughs> that is uh, it from me. If you, uh, in terms of how to listen to the show, if you'd like to support the work that I do, uh, if you like it, if you uh, want to uh, encourage me to do more of that sort of work, then you can always go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redman. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can support me, and that single solitary dollar will, of course, give you access to the exclusive bonus podcast. And uh, point of order, the uh, bonus podcast was released in the month of September. It was extremely late. Uh, it didn't come out until, uh, I believe it was the, the Sunday, the uh, 29th. Uh, the episode was eventually posted. In the evening, uh, it was a, a bonus podcast that we did with uh, our good friend Chuck Ocelli, um, of course, my producer and uh, the man behind the Ocelli effect. Uh, Chuck and I discussed uh, the return of South Park uh, season 23 as well as season 22. We did a recap of that. So if you haven't checked that out, then uh, I encourage you to go and listen to it. And uh, also, I just want to plug a uh, recent appearance uh, that I did for Media Roots Radio. Uh, Robbie Martin interviewed me, and uh, we talked about uh, we talked about the impeachment uh, proceedings, um, a QAnon uh, topics related to um, uh, the 2020 election. Uh, and at the moment, I am still uh, waiting for Robbie to send me the MP3 of that, but uh, it is. It is posted on my site uh, using uh, the Media Roots SoundCloud, so you can uh, listen to it that way. But I will, I will have the MP3 soon, and uh, so it'll be available on the feed. But uh, I want to welcome back my guest, and we are joined once again by a friend of the show, Kevin Gastola, who is, of course, the managing editor of Shadowproof.com and the co-host of Unauthorized Disclosure, which is a weekly podcast. Uh, that I encourage all the listeners to check out. And uh, Kevin Gastola, it's uh, good to have you back on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, and uh, quickly, before we we uh, uh, sort of dive into today's topic, I just want to uh, remind all the listeners that the phone lines will be open in the second hour. So if you would like to call in, if you've got uh, questions or comments for Kevin or myself, then please call in in the second hour. The number is 319 319- Five two seven five zero one six. Uh, so uh, if you call in again, you'll you'll be put on hold, uh, and then once uh, Chuck lets me know, we'll we'll bring you onto the call. And that number is three one nine five two seven five zero one six. But uh, here in the the first hour, it'll just be Kevin and myself, and we are going to be talking about uh, certainly what has come to dominate. The uh, media and the news uh, pretty much every day now, and that is this uh, case of uh, who is believed to be a CIA whistleblower who uh, formally, uh, I guess, uh, you know, made a whistleblower complaint. This is about uh, Donald Trump and a now infamous phone call between him and Ukrainian President Zelensky. And um, I, I mean, Kevin, this is uh, like I said, this is definitely a hot topic. 
Um, and uh, we're, we're going to be discussing the, the actual mechanics of this case, the specifics involving uh, the said whistleblower. But uh, before we get into that, um, why don't you just kind of break down for the listeners, what do we know uh, right now as it stands uh, about this particular case, uh, what the whistleblower is uh, blowing the whistle on, and um, you know, just sort of the, the, the general specifics of this. Well, what we have currently is a readout of a call that took place, I believe it was in the last week of July, and Trump was on a very routine call, um, at least I think they're routine, I mean, this happens all the time between leaders of countries. He was talking to Zelensky over the phone. I believe if you read it, there's some congratulations for doing well, uh, even though it had been a, a few months, I think, since he was elected the leader of Ukraine. He's talking about, because Trump likes to talk about it, how well he did winning the election in 2016, yes. <laughs> too. So there's some camaraderie there of, oh, you did well. And also, I mean, it's, I mean, it doesn't really stop there. I mean, the fact is that Zelensky is kind of uh, a sort of C-list actor in the same vein or D-list actor in the same vein of Donald Trump, who is kind of a reality television personality as well. And so they have, I think, an affection for each other. And it's clear from this call, this, this readout, that they get along. And at some point, he raises the possibility of, uh, could you look into these uh, issues related to Joe Biden and, and Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, who sits on this gas company in Ukraine? And obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. I'm actually not well versed in them, unfortunately. You're probably not going to get a lot out of me as far as like understanding what the right wing media is saying about Hunter Biden and, and everything and what has been put out there, but I, I generally have a, a basic sense of the fact that most everything out there is false beyond the fact that there is this issue of Hunter Biden never having anything to do with natural gas and never having anything to do with Ukraine and then landing on the board of this company, uh, which is, I think, something that we should be allowed to ask questions about regardless of whether Donald Trump's doing something illegal or not. And Anyways, so this comes up, and they're talking about how Attorney General Barr in, uh, c could potentially be involved, and all these these different officials are named who, you know, could you talk to my uh, lawyer, Rudy Giuliani? Um, we'll get together, and we'll try to get to the bottom of some of these things related to CrowdStrike and, and different aspects of the Russiagate investigation that Donald Trump particularly feels he should get to the bottom of because he thinks that there's more in Ukraine that was happening with Democrats than there was in Russia with the Trump Tower meeting and everything. So he's saying really the scandal is what was happening between people in Ukraine and Democrats. And I want to get to the bottom and see how it suddenly became Russia and me. And that's his whole deal. And then, you know, at some point, um, I believe this comes after. So I've kind of done this inverted. I apologize for being a little bit scatterbrained here. But after th – this is the thing that has really upset people. What we're talking about here, this idea of asking for dirt on Biden, that's how the Democrats have perceived it. This is what has really gotten people upset. But, but even so, in the readout of this conversation, there's talk about the military aid that goes to Ukraine. And that comes up first. And then later in the conversation – there's this talk about the dirt. So what has happened is the Democrats have said, well, they had this conversation about military aid. And then he said, although I'd like you to look into this, uh, the, these corruption allegations, I'd like you to look at the Bidens. And so they believe that this is a contingent on whether Ukraine would get military aid that had been going regularly to Ukraine. Um, and that's basically essentially the call. That's what we have. We have the actual call released because Donald Trump said that we all didn't understand what was going on. So they put out in this sort of rare example of transparency, a readout of the call so that we could all see for ourselves what we were, what was at issue here. And then we got the whistleblower complaint, 
And the whistleblower complaint was what the inspector general got, the inspector general of the intelligence community received. And this came from the person within, we now know, the CIA who made these allegations. And on top of what we get from the readout of the call, we also learned that there was a copy of this readout, uh, so to speak, that was put on a highly classified system within the National Security Council that's supposed to be used for particular kinds of classified information related to covert action programs um, and maybe other code word things related to the NSA, but that the Trump administration might actually be using this to hide uh, calls that they don't like when Donald Trump goes off and does something and it appears he's using his presidential office for personal gain, then they could just stuff calls in here because there's a very, very small universe of people who can have access to this information. So that's the cover-up aspect of what has been alleged so far. And I suppose the other thing that I'll get in here before we just, you know, start to branch out in all different directions mm-hmm. is that we have a complaint that started. We, we now know this from the New York Times, although the way that we learned about it, I have issues with. But we now know from the New York Times that it started with a complaint within the CIA that went to the CIA general counsel. And the CIA general counsel then turned around and and contacted the general counsel or the lawyers at the White House, and they were having conversations. So now the White House knows that there's a complaint coming from within the CIA about this call, and they start to have their own conversations about it. And then at some point, those lawyers at the White House are talking to the Justice Department to figure out there's something illegal going on here that they have to be concerned about. Ultimately, it doesn't go anywhere, and the whistleblower himself, we learn, has an issue with the fact that the White House is now involved in this because, right, he's blowing the whistle against the commander in chief. So why should they get to be involved in this? So then the whistleblower gets peeved and actually files a official whistleblower complaint with the inspector general. And that changes everything fundamentally because that's a process that is carried out independent. And that means that the people who are investigating get to pull in the person who made the complaint, they get to verify a lot of information. And then that means that that complaint, once it's verified and deemed to have a matter of urgent concern, then it can be passed on to Congress. However, the problem here is that the director of national intelligence for for national intelligence, this job that James Clapper used to occupy, um, he gets to make this decision about how that information is passed on to Congress, which means that he can kind of screw with the person who is making this disclosure in the sense that he can set restrictions on how it is brought to Congress's attention. And, and he's supposed to advise the whistleblower on how to do this in a manner that doesn't mean they're running afoul of laws, compromising classified information unnecessarily, making disclosures that are not permitted, et cetera. And if he doesn't give guidance to the whistleblower, then the whistleblower is sitting in a position where they don't want to do anything. They don't want to take the risk to go to Congress because they might end up losing their job. They might end up getting fired because they do something that's not allowed. And they don't want to be accused of a leak. I mean, you don't want to get prosecuted for a leak. There are many cases we can get into as examples. And so the whistleblower is waiting for the director for national intelligence to give him guidance so he can go on to Congress. But for the longest time, you had the committees in Congress just knowing there was a complaint, and the director for national intelligence was refusing to work with the whistleblower so that information could be passed on to Congress. It now seems that that pettiness has been bypassed by virtue of the fact that everything blew up, and there was this huge hearing where the acting director for national intelligence appeared, and it was on all of the news networks, including just the regular networks like ABC, NBC. I mean, it broke into your Monday morning programming, whatever that might be. I don't watch morning t- TV, but you know any of the like reruns that are on most channels, those were no longer airing, and you saw this hearing that was given top billing. Uh, right, quite extraordinary. I mean, I, I assume you know people that might have been watching The View uh, or something like that were, were interrupted uh, to hear the uh, director of national intelligence uh, talking about this. And uh, I mean, uh, Kevin, as you said, there, there's there's so many things there to, to kind of um, parse out. I mean, the the first one is is uh, the one that really kind of just jumps out at me is the fact that this has been known, like you said, 
to at least certain members um, within the um, you know congressional intelligence uh, committees. This has been known for a while, which is interesting. Um, but um, beyond that is is uh, maybe this is the the first thing we can kind of pick apart is that this really does seem to be different from any of the whistleblower whistleblower cases that I can remember in my lifetime and, and certainly way different from from many of the cases that you and I have discussed on the show, be it, um, you know, I mean, the biggest, the starkest uh, example is, is Reality Winner, who is still in prison right now um, and, uh, you know, obviously didn't go through the quote unquote right, you know, the, the sort of chain of command um, to report this, but I mean, this whistleblower did, and obviously um, that information was not passed along. Uh, so you can already say that I mean, you know it doesn't really work. But th- talk a little bit about this, Kevin, the, the branding of this person. I mean, there's no question they are a whistleblower. I know you you were um, uh, speaking uh, with John Kiriakou on your podcast, Unauthorized Disclosure, the recent episode, and you know you, you said that it's interesting that the media isn't referring to them as a, you know, a quote unquote whistleblower um, or alleged whistleblower. Uh, and that is interesting. And also the the fact that um, some sections of the media and certainly even more surprisingly, politicians seem to be embracing uh, this uh, whistleblower, which is something that, you know, people like Reality Winner got none of, even though she was blowing the whistle on stuff that you would think the Democrats would uh, be interested in, especially considering the uh, what the, the, these current allegations are. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit. The reason w- – without getting it – so every single whistleblower case has its own set of circumstances, and I definitely don't want to fall into the trap of pitting different whistleblowers against each other and getting into this hmm. discussion in such a way where it's like that person did it best and that one was – Or this person isn't really a whistleblower. They're just exposing things that the intelligence community supports. So that means that they're not really a whistleblower because Chelsea Manning is more of a whistleblower because they exposed information that the public wants to read but the government doesn't want anybody to see because they're for those criminal actions or whatever. I don't really Mm -hmm. want to get into that because I just don't think that that leads – anywhere productive in trying to understand what's unfolding. And I think that it doesn't really work. And I think that there should be solidarity across these cases. So while government responds differently to all of these whistleblowers, I think what we ultimately want is a system in which every one of these people would be able to come forward and not face retaliation and prosecution. So with that as a baseline, I'll say that the reason why this whistleblower is getting better treatment, so to speak, is because of the prejudice of the media establishment and the way that they think that it's proper for a whistleblower to come forward. And that appropriateness of how a whistleblower goes forward, it comes from the intelligence community itself. It comes from the uh, federal government. The White House really drives this. The attitude is that you go through a proper channel. Where it, it's pounded in our heads that a person to blow the whistle should go to their superior, go mm-hmm. to somebody um, who is a inspector general, maybe the, the the watchdog of their agency. They file their complaint, uh, they raise it, they they bring attention to this, and then that starts this inquiry or is logically would start an investigation in which you can get to the bottom of this corruption and you can deal with the fraud, waste, abuse, and illegality that might exist that that person is complaining about. But that's just not how reality works in government. Um, the people who you are blowing the whistle to often are the people who are involved in the very act of corruption that you want to expose. Right. As John Kiriakou points out, Where do I go to expose torture and waterboarding when the people in the agency are implicated themselves? And how do I even go outside of that agency, the CIA, and go to Congress when the Congress has been read in and they're going to obfuscate and cover for the CIA because they believe that the CIA is doing the rendition, detention, interrogation program in such a way 
that there really aren't these kinds of crimes against humanity happening. So how do I take issue with them and tell them that the Bush administration is waterboarding people and then they should take me seriously? I mean, most likely you're going to go to someone and you're going to be tipped off. Another key issue is if you're raising concerns about something that is corrupt and you're Thomas Drake as the NSA or you're one of these NSA whistleblowers that are concerned about the way the surveillance system is growing and metastasizing post 9-11 and you go raise concerns maybe about a private contractor and the way the program is being used and and how it's being operated and how it really isn't going to be helpful in trying to track and find terrorists and you raise issue, well, then that information makes it to the Justice Department, and then the Justice Department can use that to open up an investigation against you through the FBI, and you certainly don't want to end up under investigation because you blew the whistle. So Mm -hmm. these are several reasons why you just want to go to the press. But then if you're in the press, it's really crazy because I think of this from a journalistic standpoint. Those people are sources. Those are those are potential sources for stories that lead to reporting that we need that's in the public interest. And nobody would suggest that anything that's come out in the last two weeks about this whistleblower isn't in the public interest. We want to know what our government is doing in our name. And and yet when someone goes directly to the media and doesn't ask permission from their authority figure that they answer to – We have a media that says those people are now leaking and they're going outside the rules and they should face repercussions and they should know that what they were doing were wrong. And if it ends up in a prosecution, there's not a whole lot that we hear from the media when people are being prosecuted, particularly under the Espionage Act, which we've talked about on this podcast before in multiple conversations. And also when you have an actual document which should make it even easier and more clear that this person is a whistleblower. When you have a document that shows proof, you still get the same thing. In fact, it gets worse because you're talking about what you're not supposed to do because you signed a national non-disclosure agreement and you're expected to not reveal that information to the public. So somebody who is working in the federal government who does something on our behalf because they believe that the government is up to something that is incredibly corrupt, goes to a journalist, reveals that information, and instantly is judged not on what they're disclosing, but judged based on, ooh, I don't know if you should have acted outside, and uh, I don't, I don't really know if you should be. Uh, they don't, they're not going to like this, and I think they have a point. This is not, the rule says that you're not really supposed to go to the media and tell people what's happening in the agency because you, you might put people at risk and. Yeah, I don't, I mean, the journalists turn into narcs and they're not yes. like actually being journalists anymore. I mean, it's, it's like how, put that away. I don't know if I should see that because I'm, that's not how we're supposed to do it. And, and what you're doing is you're actually making it harder for people to come forward because I think the pre, a way it could work, I'm not saying it does work this way, but a way it could work is that people would come forward to the press because the internal systems are broken. And when people in power see that the internal systems are broken and they can either have it this way, they can have it where people go to, let's say, Rachel Maddow's show, and then she does a whole hour hyperventilating over it, (laughs) or you do it the way that they would like with more control and you have a process that actually works and protects people from retaliation, And then that is the way that we can all agree it could happen. And the inspector general process is really the best way, ideally, that you would improve upon so that you could have a nonpartisan mechanism. And it's I'd say it's fairly free from politics, surprisingly, given what happens within our executive branch. For the most part, I find myself looking at what the inspector general has been saying for the last two weeks is kind of a guidance to really understand what's working and what isn't working within the government right now. Uh, so well put there, Kevin. And, and, and I'm glad that um, you, uh, you you sort of like drew a line there in, in terms of the, uh, you know, I, not wanting to like uh, pit certain whistleblowers against one another. And, and I actually found myself even kind of doing that a couple, you know, maybe a week ago when this was first sort of coming out. And I said, oh, well, 
I, I began to sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the conspiracy theorist in me was, uh, oh, well, there's a CIA whistleblower and maybe we don't trust that. And, you know, why is this why why are they getting, uh, you know, the, the sort of the red carpet treatment when others don't? And, and I think that you're right that, that it, it's we it's we're such a, a politicized environment and it's easy to kind of fall into that. Um, whereas like you were saying, we should, you know, kind of solidarity, um, you know, amongst uh, whistleblowers. And, and also I think it. It kind of does a disservice to to just automatically assume that the person in question didn't have a strong you know belief that that they that this was wrong and that they had to blow the whistle on it. Um, and generally speaking, you know, leaving aside the the politics of whistleblowers, you know, like what their personal politics might be, they are by and large, and you would probably know this better as someone that has spoken with many whistleblowers. I mean, they are people that I think they. They do kind of believe somewhat in the, the, the system that they're working in. Um, you know, they, they, most of them go into government, you know, because they want to do good. Now, whether or not that might be misguided or, or naive is, is, is sort of separate from all of that. But, uh, they're blowing the whistle because it is some, they're seeing something like corruption, violence or something that is antithetical to why they got there. Um, and that's ultimately why they're doing it. Whereas, you know, if they were really like a the 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 quintessential kind of crooked, evil CIA officer, they probably would have never even gone through the trouble of doing this. You know, they would have just used that information, um, you know, for some other means to, to get at Trump. Uh, you know, if you're really kind of looking at it from a more conspiratorial sense, you know, why even bother with all of this? Um, also, this person is most likely going to lose their job. Um, I, the, the identity of them is, is, I'm sure almost everyone at CIA knows who this person is at this point. Um, you know, and, and, and certainly the New York Times and some other outlets seem to know a lot more about them than you or I do. Uh, so this person is probably going to lose their job. Um, so, you know, so it's, it's not like, I don't know, it, it doesn't, I, I think it's easy. And I, I was getting caught up in this as well to think, you know, well, what's the story behind the story? And then we kind of miss the the actual meat and potatoes of this. Um, and, and maybe we maybe you know we should um, kind of parse through this a little bit. I mean, like for instance, the the um, this actual uh, complaint that they, they've come with. I mean, do you think that this rises to? And this is sort of speculative, I guess. But do you think this rises to um, the occasion of having to blow the whistle? Like, is this, I, I know everyone kind of keeps asking this question, like, what's the smoking gun? Uh, and we haven't really seen that yet. But does that matter necessarily um, from the whistleblower standpoint? Well, let's start with this idea of people who are whistleblowers usually believe in what they're doing and government itself. So I think that's a really good point. And several of the people I talk about and define my understanding of how the war on whistleblowers have unfolded. John Kiriakou, Thomas Drake, uh, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, these people, many of them answer the call because they believe post 9-11 that mm -hmm. they need, and uh, John Kiriakou was in CIA before that, um, and I think Thomas Drake had been in a, a career person as well. Some of these people were even in government, but after 9-11, you know, it solidifies their resolve that there needs to be some response to what happened, the horrific attacks. And so this is the narrative, and they see what government is doing in response, and they see how government is going too far, that that civil liberties are being put at risk, that total surveillance is being expanded. Uh, with the torture program, you see that you are rounding up detainees, waterboarding them, um, and I, I know that John does not support um, what is still going on, that Guantanamo Bay is, is, is still open. You question what is being done to people there. And so this whole thing of you know, believing in good government really defines a whistleblower. And so I think when you look at what this person did coming forward, it's possible that they're intent and that what they're trying to do is valuable and that it's helpful and that it's completely legitimate. But it's also possible that they're animated by something that you and me can't get behind. 
And if the reason why this person within the CIA is blowing this whistle is because they saw what Donald Trump was doing and they said, okay, he's asking for political dirt on a candidate and you shouldn't be doing that. And also by doing this, he's going to tie it to the Ukrainian military aid. And I really, really support giving yes. military assistance to those forces that are on the ground in Ukraine. And I, I'm, as a CIA person and an analyst, I really believe in that policy. I believe that we should keep funneling hundreds of millions of dollars to militia groups that are on the ground in Ukraine. Some of them are actually neo-Nazi fighters, and we should keep giving them funds so that they can fight pro-Russian separatists that are on the ground there. I think that this is actually what the CIA does best. In fact, when I look back through history, I see a whole lot of instances where the CIA backed groups, and I'm a Charlie Wilson's war kind of a guy. So I really like this policy. Now, I don't know if I can get behind this whistleblower anymore on that policy issue, but that is... That's kind of like a policy difference, and, and you're actually not allowed to file a complaint based on a policy difference. So if this is just about the fact that Donald Trump wants to end uh, the arming of people in Ukraine, then that would not wash. This would not be an okay thing. It would be an abuse of the process. Now, if the guy really sees what's going on with Donald Trump and he's followed a fair bit of news and he knows that Donald Trump is using the office for personal gain and he sees that what he's doing with the uh, Ukrainian leader and in, in asking him to help do these investigations against people who are his political rivals, so to speak, and that rubs him the wrong way. I think I'm fine with that as a whistleblowing act, that that is something that we need to know. I I don't think you can deny that it is valuable for us to know that Donald Trump is talking to foreign leaders and saying, give me information on people who are out to get me. I want to know that information. And I think there might be a complex world that we're living in where some of those people are also directing their attention toward him and are maybe provoking and are making him irate. And there might be actors within some of these agencies that are pushing Donald Trump to the brink. We really don't know. Some of this history we may not really know until five or ten years down the line from Donald Trump's administration. What we just know is what we can suspect could be happening behind the scenes based on how Russiagate unfolded and some of the other aspects of Donald Trump's administration. But I do think that it's possible to have a discussion about the contents of the complaint, as I did with reality winner's disclosure, and then separate that from whether that person actually was engaged in whistleblowing. And I take what this man did to come forward as being a genuine act of whistleblowing, regardless of whether I want to back him in his efforts to continue arming the rebels, so to speak, in Ukraine. No, it, exactly, and and also it, then we we sort of um, we miss the the point uh, about this war on whistleblowers. You know, we we sort of in our attempt to I don't know uh, separate ourselves uh, politically from this, the CIA whistleblower, and you know we don't believe in any of that stuff or or whatnot. We, we sort of miss the point that even if if maybe this person is is someone that we ideologically disagree with or. Uh, you know, even, you know, despise, they are, you know, this is, whatever happens here will be some sort of a, uh, will set a precedent. Um, now, maybe that is that, you know, there's a, there is sort of a way to do this if you're politically advantageous enough or, or whatnot, and uh, and maybe this whistleblower will kind of be an exception to the rule. I, I tend to, to sort of, I'm not sure about that, actually. I kind of keep going back and forth. And this might, in fact, end up, um, you know, I mean, who knows? I mean, Donald Trump was – let's not forget that there's some weird audio of him floating around that the L.A. Times got a hand of, a hold of, where he, he's basically insinuating that we should start executing uh, this whistleblower or the people that, that, that leaked information to them because they're all spies, you know, and, and he's – I guess Donald Trump is surrounded by spies that are out to get him. Um, now, and again, no, me, me, even if that's true, I don't know that we should start executing people left and right uh, for doing that. So 
that's pretty harsh language, and that's kind of the the world that this particular whistleblower is entering into. Uh, and this is, and th- that's not all that different from, I mean, the, the language about wanting to drone Julian Assange and or, or lock up Chelsea Manning for the rest of her life. Uh, you know, it, that's all in that. That's all the same rhetoric, which is kind of scary. Um, and you know, I think when we kind of get into the partisan stuff, we we lose sight of that. But well, and so the Inspector General standard, just to have it for the purposes of our conversation, was: is this a serious or flagrant problem, abuse, violation of the law, or executive order, or a deficiency that's related to funding, the administration, or operation of something that would fall under the authority of the Director of National Intelligence? And it probably involves classified information. And the inspector general looked at the complaint, which, by the way, did contain firsthand information. And there's been this really uh, BS debate about whether uh, the whistleblower actually witnessed any of this or if it was just secondhand. It actually doesn't matter at all. Uh, and that's, there's no distinction in the law that you have to witness what you're blowing the whistle on. I mean, you have access to material you provide it to somebody, it confirms that there's something corrupt or abusive happening, and you basically get credit for filing that complaint, and you have the right to do it, and and it doesn't change it whether you witnessed it or not. It's just the the content itself, does it reveal something that requires our attention? If so, proceed on. It really doesn't matter if you saw it or not. Hmm. No, no, absolutely. And uh, I think... On that note, let's maybe kind of like uh, parse out a little bit about the the, the complaint itself, because yes, I know that there's this whole issue about uh, you know what uh, oh that it, that it's it's you know a secondhand conversation or, or stuff like that. I mean, um, tell the listeners a little bit just about that, Kevin. I mean, this whistleblower is this is from I guess multiple people that told uh, him or her uh, about this particular conversation. Um, although in the in that complaint, it does seem to insinuate that um, that they were a first, you know, they, they were there. There was some sort of firsthand knowledge as well, because um, I think the the, the language is um, that he that, that they were not a direct witness to to quote most of the events described. So some of them presumably they were a direct witness, um, and uh, and then also l- let's just um, expand on this too because it. it, it uh, again, John Kiriaku brought this up in, in your uh, recent discussion. A lot of times, it's not actually the crime itself that brings people down. It's the cover-up. And regardless of um, – let's just say that everything that this whistleblower was saying uh, was, was, was you know fake news, like according to Donald Trump. Then why is Trump, um, like you said, putting this in a secure computer at the National Security um, uh, with, uh, with the uh, National Security Council. So let, let's just talk a little bit about that, Kevin, and, and try and um, piece that together a bit for the listeners. So first, in terms of like what th- this person is alleging uh, this information came from, uh, maybe you can kind of shed a little bit of light on that. And then also, let's just talk about the, this, this notion of a cover-up, because that is the one thing that co- does kind of lend some credence to this. And again, uh, I'm not a Russia gator by any stretch of the imagination, but the way that, for instance, they went after Reality Winner did lead me to believe, you know, like, is there something there? You know, w- w- was there something about uh, w- the, the material that she was blowing the whistle on? So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Kevin. Yeah, so what we know is that this person was not a direct witness, as you say, but that they believed that their colleagues' accounts of events were credible, and that in almost all the cases, I'm actually reading from the whistleblower complaint, multiple officials recounted fact patterns that were consistent with one one another. In addition, a variety of information consistent with these private accounts has been reported publicly. So you have people who are involved in this call who are, I presume, leaking or talking uh, uh, talking to journalists about this call. It's the 25th of July that this phone call takes place. And so he's on the phone with Zelensky. And the people who are there who have direct knowledge of the call say that the president pressured Zelensky. And the conclusions are specifically that it would be to initiate the investigation 
or to assist in purportedly uncovering the source of allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 election or to meet or speak with two people the president named, such as uh, we're talking about Giuliani and Barr. So asking for meetings with them to discuss this information. And the, so there are people who are on the call. Um, uh, there are White House officials, people who I presume were. So this person, the CIA officer, was detailed to the White House for a short amount of time. He obviously has contacts within the White House that he knows. So this person is relaying that he is aware that within the White House, they do not feel comfortable with what happened on that call. They believe that Donald Trump did something improper during the course of that call. And, uh, and, you know, basically saying that Donald Trump expressed his conviction that the new Ukrainian government will be able to quickly improve Ukraine's image and complete the investigation of corruption cases that have held back cooperation between Ukraine and the United States. Um, um, and so essentially you've got these personnel who are on this routine call and that there's also a State Department official who listened in on the call. And there were several, several non-White House people who received this readout of the call. Again, it's not a transcript. In sloppy reporting, it's been called a transcript, but it's actually a summary of the call or a readout. And you've got people who are within the State Department and the intelligence community who have access to this. So this is the group of people that are aware that this call happens and can make this disclosure. And so that's one important part of this. And then the other part that you were talking about is the system that exists that was put uh, together um, in order to hide these calls, calls of this nature. And they're not creating a new system. The system actually exists. What they're doing is they're abusing a system that is within the National Security Council that is up there and allows for protecting information related to covert action programs, particularly overseas covert action programs, it sounds like, and then also code word um, information that is necessarily, it, it fits under the umbrella of the NSA. And then somehow you got these calls now that are in there with things that are happening that are probably technically unclassified. I mean, most of that conversation that Donald Trump's having with Zelensky isn't anything sensitive at all. Uh, those mm -hmm. are pu those are public issues. We know that military aid happens and is doled out fairly publicly within the budgets that are passed by Congress. And we also know that this co this talk, this this ongoing back and forth that happens on Fox News or even so happens on CNN about, you know, did the Bidens, were they involved in this or that? Or um, were the Russians involved with Donald Trump at Trump Tower? Um, where did it originate in Moscow? These different casts of characters that come up. I mean, Rachel Maddow's drawing chalkboard lines and <laughs> connecting the dots. And we've got all this stuff available to us. So it's not sensitive information. And yet the people there look at it and they say, this doesn't look proper, and they're shoving it in this highly classified system, which is a clear sign, as we've said repeatedly now, of something being done to cover up Donald Trump's actions. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it probably doesn't stop there. I'm sure that there are multiple other calls. In fact, we've heard rumblings of interactions with the Australian government. Um, I believe there was a report. Uh, that was put out on September 30th that was suggesting that Donald Trump had made similar requests of the Australian government of can you tell me anything about the people who are investigating I me mean, just sounds like Donald Trump feels like uh, he can get information from these foreign leaders like they know why people don't like him <laughs> and, yeah <laughs> uh, can you tell me why my government doesn't like me and they um I don't know that they have access to any information. I mean, the one problem that I kind of have with going after Trump on all of this is just the mere fact of maybe he's asking countries that don't even have access to any of this. And I don't know why they would know any more than he does about why people would be out to get him. So it just speaks to his sort of um, mental deterioration as, as, as a person who occupies this office. Uh, one thing that is worth raising that is important is the guy who was the special envoy to Ukraine. I don't know if you've had a chance to dig into this at all yet, Pierce, but the guy who was 
the special envoy to Ukraine, was a volunteer and was doing it while also having a position as the uh, as a person who worked for the lobbying firm BGR Group and also the McCain Institute. His name is Kurt Volker, and he's going to testify on right. the third on October third. He's going to testify. I don't know if that's going to be an open hearing. It could be closed. And he's also got financial ties to Raytheon, the manufacturer of the Javelin system. So there's a good report out there at Politico about his role and how um, – and I, I think this is – you know, we're getting into stuff where, like, I really think this is what deserves the kind of attention that we're that, – you know, from what we have, this is the sort of thing that we could be focusing more time upon. Um, however, it's not as fun as, you know – how many tweets are Trump sending today? It really looks like he's losing his mind. But mm. um, but Volker was in favor of this arming of the rebels in Ukraine, supporting lethal weapons going to Kiev. Uh, he was a backer of this Javelin missile system. The manufacturer actually describes this as, quote, the world's most versatile and lethal one-man portable anti-tank guided munition and surveillance weapon system. And so he's got this link to Raytheon that is the manufacturer of the system, and Raytheon has made millions of dollars from Trump's uh, decision and, and, and support for sending these uh, this weapon system to Ukraine. Uh, there were about $500 million. This is a huge sum of money that was earmarked back in 2017, I believe, for the Ukrainian military, and they got this funding. We backed a coup that toppled the government in 2014, and there's been fighting that's ongoing for the last years. And so this system going there is something that the CIA is clearly involved in. And Kurt had been there in Ukraine fully supporting it, um, putting some realism on the policy that was there suggesting that, you know, there's a very real limitation to what the Trump administration can do to get back land that Russia has annexed within Ukraine. But then also saying that, like, you know, we're going to support some of these groups to engage in these fights and assert yourself against any, like, Russian incursions. And um, and I know that's kind of outside the scope of what's going on here with the impeachment process, but it is the backdrop. It's the foreign policy backdrop. And I think what really makes it difficult as far as the different political parties go is that you have this clear sense that the things that drive Democrats to impeachment are the acts that offend the national security establishment or end up undermining the American empire project. So any time that Donald Trump does not want to engage in policies that are backed fully by the CIA, FBI, or the NSA, then you have the panic within the establishment that there's something we need to do to contain this man so that you don't roll it back. I mean, I actually think that if you look at the readout, there's really not a clear uh, evidence of, of quid pro quo necessarily. And also the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, doesn't actually recall uh, this this pressure of, of feeling like, oh, if I didn't do this and look into these corruption allegations that then I was going to lose this military aid. And there's not really – nothing really happens to the aid, I think, until a few weeks after the call even took place. So as far as the timeline goes, it's hard to buy into those being tied together. Um, but there's a clear example of him at least saying to – Zelensky that you know he does want this information which is a separate issue alone but they're they're bringing the whole issue of Ukraine into it because those are the people this represents the interests of the people who really want Donald Trump the most it's the people who believe that he would take the United States down a path that they don't support as far as their foreign policy agenda and I think that they're more upset that he's talking about ending the Ukrainian aid or putting it at risk by pressuring Europe, European countries to put more money into NATO and these other outfits. So I, it's actually was – when he defended what he did, he said, you know, I didn't suspend this aid over this call. I suspended it as like a message to the European countries that I want them to step up and fund these 
groups in Ukraine this, and provide money for this military aid and that the U.S. shouldn't have to do it all and that they need to be a, an equal partner that the EU has to come in and provide money as well. And I think doing that really upsets the people in the foreign policy establishment or the national security apparatus who say to themselves that this is just inappropriate the way it's being handled, that there are arrangements that have been ironed out and he's disrupting and they don't like the disruptive potential that he plays as president. And so that is, I think, why this really becomes the catalyst that gets us to an impeachment inquiry. I mean, the things that are worthy of impeachment, in my opinion, I'm, I'm going on and on here, but it, it's really difficult when you pay close attention to Donald Trump's administration and see things that should offend the senses of people who are in Congress, and then they don't lead to impeachment. Uh, you know, rounding up children and putting them in right. concentration-style camps at the border, it, that, it should be something in our uh, books that make that uh, an impeachable offense, and then you can do something to defend the office and remove him from power. Uh, you have the fact that he's a climate change denier, and he's rolling back EPA laws, and he's going against policies, and you know, it's going to be like 90 in D.C. on October 2nd or 3rd, and that should send a message to people that something is off and we need to actually address this crisis. And we've had a global climate strike and there's been people trying to call attention to how we need to radically change so that we can survive as people. And yet you see him very much conspiring to reverse any sort of regulations that the Environmental Protection Agency has, um, uh, re, uh, undoing protections on federal lands, opening up areas for drilling, and 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 yet that's not an impeachable offense. That's not something that gets the Democrats worked up to go and impeach. There are things related to the way he handles his taxes. Uh, it, it may be a little slightly gratifying that now we're hearing about a possible tax whistleblower as we – this broke, this news broke a couple hours before we went to the show. So, I mean, if you haven't heard it, I'm not stunned, but apparently there's a way in which there's a presidential audit program for taxes and they're not, it's not clear that Donald Trump isn't manipulating in some way. We know that he is devaluing his assets and then also lying about his wealth. There is clear evidence out there of things that deserve prosecution probably i mean if he wasn't the president of the united states he certainly would be subject to an investigation by any of these u.s attorney's offices probably and yet because he's president he has cover to engage in this conduct it would seem and so then you find yourself sitting back and going we're really going to impeach over the fact that he wants to he, he had a talk about getting dirt on Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. And that's going to be the thing. And, it, oh, it's going to be because the Democrats want to keep the flow of weapons going to Ukraine like they haven't already – like they didn't learn any lessons from arming the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against Russia or the Soviet Union. Like they want to just keep at this and try to sap the resources of Russia – and create these fringe extremist groups and, and pump them up until they might actually, I think, I think FBI just indicted someone who was linked to one of these groups and it got really no attention, but, um, it's tied to what has been happening in Ukraine with these neo-Nazi fighters. And so it's just incredible that this is where we're going to be at because I don't know that rhetorically it's a win for the Democratic Party. Because talking about how we need to bring down Trump because he has questions about the origins of the Russiagate investigation and maybe he would jeopardize aiding Ukrainian fighters, I don't know if that's a strong place for the Democrats to argue from in the 2020 primary and then the 2020 general election. It's definitely not a core part of the platform for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, which have enjoyed the most momentum, it would seem, and they have a more holistic and a better focus on human needs and everything. And so if you could bring that into it, if impeachment could be about how he wants to defund and remove millions upon millions of dollars from Medicare, Medicaid, and, 
and then the way like he might be subverting social security and those other programs that people need, I feel like that might be a stronger basis. But then you have impeachment being launched, and I don't think they're really that committed to the inquiry anyways, but you have impeachment, and I just don't know that it's coming from a place of strength. Uh, so much good stuff there, Kevin. I'm glad you you brought all that up, and we'll, we'll uh, you know we're we've only got about uh, maybe four minutes here in the first hour, so we will definitely be picking up on a couple of these topics in the second hour. Um, but I, I think you, you you just did such a great job of like breaking it down, particularly this um the the sort of I don't know pettiness uh, of so much of this, which I think also kind of gets lost. Um, in in the the storm of of uh, you know uh, MSNBC breaking news impeachment crisis you know and countdown clocks and all of that kind of nonsense we sort of miss um, the forest for the trees there and and I did not know about uh, Kurt Volkler's uh, connections with Raytheon and that is a uh, particularly interesting um and there i mean there, there's that, that does seem to be like there's some kind of a a strand there and yes i think that the, the democrats and uh those that um might be involved in this uh are that uh you know i don't know cynical or petty is to you know we're going to impeach the president for basically asking um you know for dirt on a, a, a political rival side and also even that in and of itself it's like there, I think there's something off with uh, whatever Hunter Biden was doing at uh, <clears throat> Burisma Holdings, this uh, massive energy company. But it's also kind of and, – and it, it's pathetic that the Democrats are like, oh, there, there's nothing wrong with um, the son of the vice president being awarded a cushy position where he never actually has to go to Ukraine. He knows nothing about Ukraine. Oh, and this is all after we helped to foment a – uh, color revolution where we overthrew the uh, democratically elected government and put in our own government. And you know, imagine if this was Trump uh, doing this in Ukraine and giving, you know, and Ivanka was uh, sitting on on the, uh, you know, board of directors of some energy company. Obviously, they would be asking questions about this, but it also just sort of seems like it's like par for the course. You know, they're all doing these sort of corrupt things. Um, and then, you know, when you couple that with the the actual, like, uh, not that those aren't serious crimes. I mean, I guess they are. But like you said, the uh, deporting children, um, you know, locking them up indefinitely, uh, the the obvious degradation and destruction of the environment. Uh, and, and Trump obviously talking about, I mean, impeachable. Not only is he sort of denying that uh, it's, you know, the, the climate is screwed, but he, he's also just so in bed with all the oil companies and, and yep. arms companies that are contributing to all of this. Um, so you know, a lot of conflicts of interest there. But like you said, you know, it, no, it, it's really about, um, you know, the CIA and Raytheon wants to sell more weapons. So that's that's, you know, this is how we're going to go about it. Uh, but those are really important questions that we, we need to be looking at. And um, we're, we're, we're probably coming up uh, just towards the end here in the first hour, so we will we will continue this. But um, I also want to talk about that there's another character along with Volker. I wasn't familiar with Volker, but there is also T. Ulrich Brechtbulb, uh, or Brechtbull. Um So many people can Google him. He is also connected with this and has his own interesting uh, connections with the aerospace industry. Um, so we'll, we'll continue this in the second hour with – uh, our friend Kevin Gostola of shadowproof.com. Once again, the phone lines will be open, so if you want to call in, it's 319-527-5016. But uh, we will be right back after this quick commercial break. Straight out of the subway in New York City. Yeah, baby. The radio show that never sleeps. Porkins Policy Radio with Pierce Redman. Street, Street 
Radio.com. Gold, silver, the stock market. Wall Street Window.com. The brilliant author of The War State brings you exclusive reports about the big changes upcoming in the markets. Wall Street Window.com. Perhaps you're invested deeply. Perhaps you're not in deep enough. Maybe you're thinking about getting started. WallStreetWindow.com Window.com. Michael Swanson, the brilliant author of The War State, understood these trends professionally for many years, and now he gives you the benefit of his knowledge. WallStreetWindow.com Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. Somebody told me the other day that martial law is coming. We're going to get thrown into the FEMA camp. Should I be scared or not? No. That's a, that is a... Uh, it might be true. Uh, could be. Could be, but I don't think so. I bet I know who would know. Somebody who does a show on the Ocelli.com radio network. Somebody who know. Charlie Chalkcom would know. He better, will know. Better listen to it. Better listen to him. And he knows what he's talking about. Ocelli.com. News, entertainment, and more. You will learn something, children's Ocelli.com. Now back to the man, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are joining us here in the second hour, we are still speaking with friend of the show, Kevin Gastola, of course, the managing editor of Shadowproof.com and the co-host of Unauthorized Disclosure. Definitely recommend both of those if you are not familiar with them. Uh, his, uh, of course, we are continuing our conversation about the, uh, the this new whistleblower complaint revolving uh, around Trump and Ukraine. We're going to talk about uh, the, the uh, impeachment proceedings and um, maybe get Kevin's perspective on the, the politics behind this. And, of course, 
We are also uh, opening up the phone line, so if you have a question for Kevin or myself, then please call in to 319-527-5016. You'll be put on hold, and then, of course, uh, once uh, I am told that uh, the caller is on the line by Chuck, we will bring you on. That number is, once again, 319-527-5016. Kevin, I wanted to um, pick up... Uh, in the end there, the, the first hour, you were really on a roll, and you were, you were uh, as you were talking, there were just like so many little light bulbs were going off in my head, and, uh, you know, you were talking about this uh, uh, Kurt Volker, who is, a, he just resigned, um, I think, what was this, like Friday or so? Um, yeah. And, you know, it's funny, I, 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 I couldn't figure out who he was, and then I, I just was uh, Googling him. Uh, just before we came back on, and, and that's why the name sounded kind of familiar. He was, of course, a um, uh, U.S. ambassador to NATO, um, uh, briefly. Uh, but um, you're talking about his sort of conflict of interest, his connections to Raytheon, and that um, did remind me, uh, in preparation for this, there, there was another name, and this was like, it was such a bizarre name that like I had to look it up, but it, it's named, I think, directly in the um, whistleblower complaint. Uh, this uh, a person by the name of T. Ulrich Brechtbull. Brechtbull? I think that's his last name. And um, he's identified as someone that also listened in on this July 25th, 2019 phone call. And uh, I'll just uh, give a little bit of a, a, a background on him, and I'll throw it to you, Kevin, for your, your thoughts on this. But um, this is a – he's a counselor – of the United States State Department. He's been in that office since 2018. I guess this is like essentially they're just sort of like advisors. I'm not really sure. But interesting, uh, you were saying, you know, Volcker's connection with Raytheon. Well, uh, Breckbull is, uh, was a, um, he was one of the, helped found Mike Pompeo's aerospace company, Thayer Aerospace. And, uh, you know, the reason that he helped him uh, found that is because they were classmates together at West Point. Um, and I believe that it was actually Mike Pompeo that brought uh, Brett Bull in to the uh, State Department. Um, you know, he doesn't really have any formal education in that. He went to, you know, he studied like business administration at the Harvard Business School uh, and went to West Point. Uh, but other than that, you know, I don't know what qualifies him to be in the State Department. But anyway, uh, have you have you looked into this character at all? I, I only bring him up just because it's it, it's like a, a you know you were mentioning Kurt Volker uh, connections um, not only with NATO but also you know he was a an analyst at the CIA. Um, he was uh, on the legislative staff of John McCain. Um, he also worked for the McCain Institute connections with Raytheon. Then you've got this guy Brett Bull. Uh, connections with Mike Pompeo, who apparently was also on this phone call. I saw that this morning at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, also, um, you know, helped him with his uh, aerospace company. So it, it just seems like a, it, it's a bizarre cast of characters. And um, I know that Mike Pompeo has this sort of reputation as being, uh, I don't know, like close with Trump. But I, I do kind of wonder sometimes, you know, um, if he doesn't sort of see him as like a means to an end. And um, it's interesting that you've got this, uh, you know, the, the, this guy who's obviously uh, a, a crony of Mike Pompeo's, who's also being named uh, formally by this whistleblower. So, any thoughts on that, or, or it's simply just on this character Ulrich Brechtbull? I'm not really familiar with the specific individual, but what I do think is important here is this is a clear example of how there are several characters that populate the Trump administration who are there to enrich themselves and to mm. find ways in which they can enrich the companies where they're from and that they worked for. And there's a whole, it's not the first time that government has been this way. I don't think so. And if you go through the last, you know, 100, 150 years, I'm sure there's examples um, even if you go to like the robber baron era of America, I'm sure you could look and see executives having their alliances with certain politicians, working to get in infrastructure projects, etc. But what is very clear is that Donald Trump is very open about forming these alliances and relationships with aerospace, defense contracting groups, forming, uh, you know, it might be private prison contractors, it could be any of these companies, 
bringing them in to the process of government. And it's truly a conservative philosophy on steroids because you don't think that government – you want less government. But what you want is that private companies can provide the services of a government. Or you want to find a way to work corporations into the providing of these different services. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like a service that any of you – we're not using, but (laughs) arming the people who are in Ukraine that are fighting the Russian separatists. I mean, Donald Trump presents an opportunity for you if you can maneuver. And the fact is that Barack Obama was actually hesitant to fully get on board with this 100%. Uh, There was a lot of his administration that was slow to get behind just, you know, going all out and and arming these people in the same way that he was slow to support, you know, having a no-fly zone and putting that in Syria. And there's aspects of his administration that definitely slowed down the push that many people wanted to see from parts of the government to involve these players. And I think with Donald Trump, there's just... There's no limits. You can do whatever you want. Just c- come in. You want to be my friend and work with me? We can do this together. <laughs> yeah, and it's also uh, for someone uh, that – Donald Trump in particular who seems to have surrounded himself with uh, members of the arms industry and aerospace industry. You know, it, it would be funny if uh, you know it was one of their own that, um, that did sort of uh, contribute to bringing him down. And I'm speaking specifically – of course, of the, you know, former um, uh, acting uh, Secretary of Defense, Patrick Shanahan, who was uh, a, I think he was like a CEO of Boeing for 30 years. Well, you know, who does he get replaced by? Um, Mark Esper, um, who uh, is now our Secretary of Defense, who is a vice president of government relations at Raytheon. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> of course, um and there's a bunch of other people uh, within the uh, uh, Defense Department, you know, lower-ranking uh, people that all have these uh, uh, direct connections to the uh, arms industry, uh, defense contractors, and whatnot. So it's it's just interesting, um, you know, that you, when you surround yourself by these people, I mean, they are they are fairly cutthroat. Um, and yeah, I think it just sort of illustrates the uh, there's the same thing too with this guy uh, uh, Brechtbull. Who knows exactly what his role is, but clearly. He's just some crony of Mike Pompeo. I mean, that's the only reason that he's in that position. Um, and it just sort of goes to show, I mean, I, I think that, that that sort of cronyism always happens in politics. But there's something about with the Trump administration where it can be so kind of like naked, um, almost to the point where it's like nobody's really batting an eye. Uh, it's just sort of, again, par for the course that you would have these people uh, uh, connected there. Um, and, and then, you know, all of that does, I know you were sort of alluding to this in, in the first hour, Kevin, but I mean, the, the, when you start to kind of uh, piece these seemingly disparate pieces together, there does seem to be like a grander sort of agenda uh, behind uh, perhaps why uh, this, uh, maybe not necessarily why this whistleblower is blowing the whistle on this, although we did explore that that possibility that this is about, you know, um, partly to do with the, the the desire to arm Ukraine and against the Russians and whatnot, um, but uh, you know it certainly could be being exploited by some of these other figures that again have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo of doing all this and and maybe we could just a little bit just sort of touch on uh, Trump specifically in this um, you know this this phone call and then I do want to kind of get into. Um, the actual, uh, you know, the politics of impeachment, but just because so, we we were talking about this off the air, me, you, and Chuck were sort of joking about the the sort of tenor, perhaps that Donald Trump uses in this conversation with uh, Vladimir Zelensky, where yes, there is no quid pro quo, but you know, it it does it does seem I don't think that um, you know Trump just sort of asks for things, you know, just to just to ask for them. And maybe you could comment a little bit on that. I mean, uh, you know, like, for instance, th- this idea that there is no quid pro quo. I mean, does that really matter? I mean, can can we interpret what Trump is saying as, as sort of uh, that there was a quid pro quo? 
Um, or, or perhaps that maybe that doesn't really matter uh, in the in the grand scheme of things. But I'm just interested, Kevin, your take on this. So I I go back to I don't know if it's identical. It, it certainly comes out a little bit differently. But in my head, something I thought about when I read this complaint was the time when Donald Trump stood in front of uh, I think he was at his own rally. Uh, it was an indoor rally, and it was a speaking event. It, he was on the campaign trail back in 2016, and he set off all the centrist Democrats, all the Clinton Democrats went crazy because they said, you're inviting the Russian government to hack into Hillary Clinton's email servers or whatever. He said something very sarcastically right, about right. finding the 30,000 emails, and I take that even if it's not delivered well as a joke and that he wasn't completely serious and that he was making an offhand remark of like, if anybody could find him, maybe the Russians could because everyone was fixated on what the Russians were doing. Um, I think at that point we had already had this whole thing begin to erupt around the Podesta emails. And so I kind of look at what's happening here in this call and I say, the problem that I have with Trump is it's hard to know what he's being, you know, what he's being serious about and what what he's not being serious about. But let's just say, for the purposes of this conversation, that he is completely serious. It's just the way that his brain works. He's not like he's not openly tying the two together. So I just think that it's worth getting more verification. If we're going to impeach, we should actually know that there was some kind of link between the two. And for me, I don't feel like the call is enough to confirm that there was some kind of a link. Um, and also the reason why I guess I don't, I mean, you could say I'm deliberately trying not to believe that they're tied together, but the reason why I'm resistant is just because I feel like there are many things related to his policy that involve trying to roll back some of these, this foreign aid to different places and to say, we want other outlets to step in. We want the European countries to play their role as well. And it's, it's really difficult to me. I mean, maybe both are true. Maybe he wants Europe involved and he's also using this aid and he's saying, I'm going to like hold it up until I get stuff. Uh, but I also say like, He's making this statement, and I don't believe that he probably had even talked to anybody about seriously doing this. So <laughs> as far as premeditation goes, I don't know that there's a crime in the sense that like there's nothing worked out already to suspend the military aid. So I guess it's an empty threat. I mean, if you're hearing it and you're Ukraine, you have no evidence at all to support that any of this aid's been held back. What I'm saying is, it works a lot better if you're going to threaten somebody, if you actually suspend the aid and then you get on the phone and you say, I will release this, but you have to give me information related to these corruption investigations that I would like to have. I want to know this information about Hunter Biden. And that didn't happen. And maybe it doesn't have to be clear cut. Um, I mean, the thing is that we're kind of like grasping at things and, and I'm doing it as well. We're grasping at things that aren't really necessary in order to get Donald Trump in trouble because he's asking a government for information and it would violate campaign finance law just to have that government provide that information to him because he's getting a benefit from a foreign power that can help him win an election if he gets anything that's useful. And so that right there alone become something that is worthy of having an inquiry over. Oh, totally. And also, if it's true that uh, he, he was, I don't know, bothering the uh, Australian prime minister, um, you know, at this point, if he's already asked two foreign leaders, one can only assume that anytime he he's uh, on a phone call, he might even like bring it up. Um, and that, that that seems kind of in line with, uh, you know, the Donald Trump that we know and love. And yeah, I think that 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 at the very least is you know should uh, it should bring about some kind of in, in, inquiries. We we should have a an understanding. Um, you know, why is the president doing this? Is he doing it? I mean, one thing that just sort of like popped into my mind 
when you were talking there and I was just sort of thinking about it, it's like, I, I know you mentioned this a little bit in the first hour, but I mean, his, just his mental state, um, is he so paranoid that, you know, uh, he just sort of like blurted this out on a phone call. I mean, like you said, I, I tend to agree with you, um, that, I don't know that this was like premeditated or, or, or anything. I assume that um, most of, if not all of the people that were on that phone call, I mean, part of the reason that they probably told the CIA whistleblower is because they were so caught off guard that he would just sort of do that. And, you know, asking a foreign leader for dirt on, on, a, on an opponent, that doesn't seem like some, I'm sure all presidents have done that at some point uh, like that doesn't really surprise me, but, and, and I don't know that it would necessarily surprise all those people on that phone call, but maybe what surprised him is, is how, you know, nonchalant he was about it, that there was no nuance that, um, you know, if, uh, if the, you know, this is like what brought down Nixon. He was, he was talking too openly on the phone and, and the, in, in these conversations. I mean, there's, there's no wiggle room for, you know, plausible deniability or, or to sort of say, that's not really what I meant. Um, when he just sort of like out of nowhere is like, I, I, you know, give me some, you know, look into the Bidens for me. Uh, so God knows how many other phone calls are like that out there. But yeah, it does, it does sort of wonder. I mean, is he, his mental state? I mean, is he so paranoid? I mean, this whole issue, I don't, maybe you know, I, I don't really understand this, why he thinks the DNC servers are in Ukraine. I mean, I know there's some, connection between that and CrowdStrike, I don't really know what it is, but that either seems like something that someone told him and he's now obsessed with this as a, as an idea and it's like, who the hell told him this? Or he just made that up out of whole cloth, but he's so paranoid uh, that he genuinely believes it to be true. Both of which are kind of scary. Well, I do think what we're seeing is that Donald Trump is – seeking any information he can get on the people who work for him because he wants to know if anyone's being disloyal. And I don't know that that's particularly new. I would say that it it seems from the very basic understanding I have of him as a businessman that this just might be his attitude that at any moment, um, you know, he wants to know if people who work under him are actually still working in his best interests. And that the impulsive nature of Donald Trump and the way he can change on a dime is that he will look at you and suspect that maybe uh, you're not with him anymore. And then you have to prove yourself that you are with Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump's the kind of person who is very um, it, you know, it, into making these irrational decisions that lead to you spur of the moment being cast out. You're no longer in the circle of trust, so to speak. And you, mm. you get, you're gone, get out of here. And we've seen a huge, and you know, I guess the thing that supports what I'm suggesting is the turnover that has existed in this administration. I mean, we have sure. more people um, who have cycled in and out of this administration than you know, you could probably look to the Obama and the Bush administration, maybe we even can go back and include the Clinton administration, too, and find that there have been more people that have cycled through the Trump administration than those administrations. And so it just feels like we've had a lot of people come in and out. And it's because if he's watching television, he starts to think that, like, you don't have the what it takes to be part of his administration anymore, then he no longer has confidence in you. And that's that's how this all changes. And. So, I mean, I think that there's this part of his brain as it's deteriorating from all this pressure that he's under that he thinks that people are out to get him. I mean, it's like, I think that's largely how Nixon was feeling when he was facing everything turning against him. Um, I think uh, there's a bit to like J. Edgar Hoover where he thought that like, yeah. I want to be on top of everything. I want to know. I want to know people's secrets. I not only want to know what everyone knows, but I want to know what people don't know before they even think they know it kind of a thing <laughs> where like he could be the first to learn about something within the White House and then that president actually would be second to learn. Like, he would know what was happening in an administration before the people who were actually running the administration. And that just gives you 
a sort of power. And I think for Donald Trump, it's kind of like constantly playing catch up to, because he think he feels like there are people. I really believe that there are people within the CIA, FBI, the justice department and the NSA who are working at a level that just kind of flies over his head that he just doesn't quite understand what's happening and grasp that there are larger policies and programs that are being carried out, um, that he just doesn't grasp what is happening. And then when he wants to change something and finds out how entrenched those are in the government, that he feels like people are out to get him. But the pushback is from people being set in their ways and not wanting to change. And so it's like, again, I'm not making any like apologies for what he did, but this these conversations that he has has with foreign leaders are completely different from any conversations that like Barack Obama would have or even George W. Bush in the sense of like how open they are and the kinds of things he's asking for people to do. And it's it's just not the way business has been done. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we feel that way because uh, the Democrats just are like, that's impolite or that's not nice or you shouldn't do that to people or is there actually something that's illegal that's being done or is there actually something corrupt that needs to be pursued because just I don't really care if the guy from the former national security advisor for Obama is sitting on CNN saying like oh you're just not supposed to do it that way Donald Trump (laughs) like that doesn't really I don't want a full blown scandal over Donald Trump doesn't understand etiquette in the White House because I yes. just I just don't care. Like I don't really there's there are more fundamental problems for me to go on and on about and and I think focus my attention and you know you know Donald Trump used the wrong fork at the dinner table does it really amount to something that I should be concerning a lot of my time with? No, it, it, entirely, exactly, and and I know, I mean, that's that's why I, I, I you know, I I just don't know how far this is really going to go, and maybe that that kind of brings us maybe to the the actual issue of impeachment. But like you were saying, is this um are are we trying to impeach Donald Trump for being crude at um you know asking something that other presidents might have already you know have asked in the past, uh the sort of brazen nature of it. I mean, you know, it's sort of like uh, when, I don't know, if you're like a crime boss, you may not actually say, you know, go out and kill so-and-so. You might say, well, why don't you take care of him? Or, you know, uh, make sure he doesn't, you know, talk or something, you know, whereas Donald Trump would be like, let's kill, can we kill him? You know, I mean, that, that's as evidenced by these weird uh, things where he's telling, you know, the LA Times has where he's talking about executing people. But, um, you know, like you were saying, I mean, are we are we impeaching him based on etiquette? I mean that that this whole question of impeachment seems bizarre to me. Um, and I I was recently talking about this um, with Robbie Martin on his show, and uh, you know we were both sort of of, of, of two sort of uh, thought process on this, and I'll throw them to you, Kevin, to get your perspective. But I mean, number one, it just seems like the worst possible time to do this. And I don't think this, this, this won't be like, you know, groundbreaking or revolutionary for anybody, but obviously with the election, the 2020 election happening, why would the Democrats decide to take all the oxygen in the room and um, focus on impeachment hearings, which may not even amount to anything? Uh, You know, no one, no president has, has actually been impeached. Uh, it, you know, you know, what I mean, I mean or they, they might be impeached by the House, but nothing actually happens to them. They're either acquitted by the Senate or they, you know, like with Nixon resign before anything could happen. So the the likelihood of, of what him being removed from office or something, it's just not going to happen. Um, but then it's also, you know, why waste the time when there are some real policy discussions happening? I'm not the biggest fan of Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, but there are they are posing interesting policies, or at least they're they're, they're posing something other than just sort of you know uh, elect me because I was the vice president of a popular president with Joe Biden, or you know elect me because I'm the most authoritarian police like figure 
um, you know, that, that can be allowed in office like Kamala Harris. There is something uh, to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren that I think offers at least a, a, a bit of discussion. So why – I mean, now maybe this is this is something that Robbie and I uh, thought about. Maybe that this is sort of part of their whole thing is they, they don't want to actually have a real policy discussion. They would rather the discussion amongst the 2020 candidates be, well, are you are you for impeachment or against impeachment? And I wonder if that's what what happens if if this sort of goes forward, that that becomes the main talking point. And, um, you know, I'd like to get your perspective on that, Kevin, and also just the, this idea that, um, you know, why uh, why do you think Nancy Pelosi went with this? Um, you know, I, because it does seem like she was sort of backed into a corner a little bit. And I didn't quite think about that at first. But, you know, on retrospect, I mean, uh, and, and, you know, I was listening to you and John Kiriakou talk about this and others. You know, it, it seems like she was kind of forced into this position. Um, so then it's sort of like, is she just doing this to save her own bacon? Um, or, it, you know, is it possible that there is more to this story? That maybe Nancy Pelosi, she is a skilled politician. Um, you know, you, you can't take that away from her. Perhaps she has something up her sleeve that we're not aware of. So anything on that, Kevin? Any, anything you want to kind of pick apart on that? Yeah, so I think that the reason why the Democrats want to make impeachment the focus is, uh, one, I don't think Nancy Pelosi did this by choice. As you're suggesting, I had this conversation with John Kiriakou, and it's my feeling that Nancy Pelosi was basically dragged into backing impeachment. And the evidence is that this was kind of a catalyst that spurred more people to support impeachment. But you had a lot of allegations already before this scandal around the Ukraine call, and it was – you know, we've had people who are upset about not getting tax returns. You've had people t- really upset about Russia Gate. We've had people upset about uh, the way you know he's handling immigrants. There's all kinds of different things that have been the catalyst for turning people against him and saying they want to have an impeachment process to look at what he's doing improperly with the office of the president, uh, even ways he's enriching himself. Um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, raised some really good questions about his golf courses in New York uh, during one of the hearings. He asked um, uh, Michael Cohen when he was testifying before a committee, she asked him about the way in which uh, Donald Trump is basically cooking his books and not being forthright about um, his, his accounts. And so there are all these different elements. And I think a lot of the progressive Democrats may not put the Russiagate investigation at the at, as the focus of why they want to impeach Trump when they're talking about him. I think they want to be able to maybe branch off and look for some other things that are more uh, germane or interesting to their base. It's just like we're not – a lot of the progressives really just have kind of moved on from this. But then there's the center Democrats, the centrist Democrats who really dwell on this. And that's where I agree with what you and then Robbie Martin are saying, which is that you know, impeachment could be a really good tool for you if you want to distract from the surge of attention that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are enjoying through their platforms. That uh, candidates aside, let's just focus on the policies that are being put forward. And when you combine their platforms, you have a very, very strong, a very, very strong platform for lifting up the poor and working class and giving them more power and and controlling the redistribution of wealth to the top, um, placing more constraints on what the, the rich are able to do, forcing the wealthy elites to pay more into programs, undoing tax loopholes, um, trying to find a way to provide more for basic human needs. And then I suppose I'm leading into a stupid rhyme, but like to diminish corporate greed and to go after uh, what people are able to get away with in this country and how there's no accountability for a lot of their actions and changing that dynamic. So government doesn't just work for the 1%, but obviously that Occupy Wall Street mantra that existed of having a government for the 99%. Uh, I think Bernie and Elizabeth really represent 10 years down the road, the, the 
politics of Occupy Wall Street really making its way into mainstream political discourse, which tends to happen when you have a really vibrant movement. After a decade, you can expect it, if it's highly successful, to make it into mainstream politics. And it has. It really has. And I think that the Democratic Party establishment looks at it and they shudder. And one evidence, you know, we can kind of pick apart this as an as a, as a example. You know, one thing that happened is CNN ran the story over the weekend that was a headline. These five freshman congresswomen changed history by becoming unlikely leaders on impeachment. But what was baffling about it is that the people who they highlighted were Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan, Abigail Spanberger of Virginia. They're both ex-CIA officers. Chrissy Houlihan, who was in the Air Force. She's from Pennsylvania. Mikey Sherrill of New Jersey and Representative Elaine Luria of Virginia, who are naval officers. So you've got five people that they handpick who are from the military or the CIA. And it's deliberately erasing the explosion of support and the shift that took place among progressives with people like Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, you have um, Ayanna Presley, you've got uh, Ilan Omar, you've got these, you've got the people who are really becoming the face of progressive Democrats. And then you have CNN come in and almost do this really nice PR piece for the Democratic Party to show that, oh, no, like, the reason why we got to impeachment isn't because of this push by them. It's not that they won and finally got to Nancy. It's that these moderate House freshman Democrats came around to this. And so we ought to privilege them. And they say that they call themselves badasses. This is in the CNN thing. I think badasses kind of came organically from the group since we all had either served in the military or in the CIA. So they're pumping themselves and they're talking about how great they are because of their background. Um, but then again, this goes back to, hey, they probably really do want to impeach Donald Trump because he doesn't want to fund the rebels in Ukraine against Russia anymore. Um, and, you know, they probably want to go after Trump because he's thinking about ending military involvement and support for certain uh, groups that have been fighting the Assad regime in Syria. Or they don't really want to support Trump anymore because they think he's, you know, willing to roll back certain programs or he doesn't take the Russia Gate investigation seriously. He's constantly suggesting that there's not a lot to support it. And so they want to focus on that. And I think that there's a, there's a, there's, there's two things happening simultaneously that provide uh, a, a lot of complex discussion. And the first thing is that you have people who are trying to win a certain narrative against Donald Trump, and it involves defending the interests of the United States empire, so to speak. And then you've got the fact that uh, there's a whole entire Democratic Party that recognizes it is losing influence with their base to kinds of politicians who are from the brand of Bernie Sanders. They're in the mold of Bernie Sanders. They're like Elizabeth Warren. These are primary challengers. You know, you've had threats put out to people from the Democratic Party of like, how dare you challenge incumbents who are Democrats that are in Congress? We will not have that. And if you, uh, if certain firms work on primary challenger campaigns, then they'll be like blacklisted. It's been kind of vicious and mm -hmm. they really don't want certain conversations to play out within the Democratic Party. Uh, they don't want Medicare for all. They don't want a Green New Deal. They don't want radical politics to push the Democratic Party into new territory and to actually make it competitive and an opposition party uh, uh, that can challenge Republicans and Donald Trump. And so those are the two things that have really happened. And I think the nightmare scenario for Democrats, if you will, is that they would vote to impeach Donald Trump in the House, and he's impeached, and then it goes to trial in the Senate. And Mitch McConnell has already said he's going to do the trial, that he would have to, under his obligations as Senate Majority Leader, hold a trial. But, you know, uh, he understands as well as anyone, what if you just put on a show of how, like, Donald Trump is a uh, subject of a witch hunt, and you could show that Democrats are really coming after him, and he could really try to do any sort of things he had to do to point out to the American people that Donald Trump doesn't really deserve all this. And he could do this in the election year. 
I mean, there's nothing better for the GOP to show during an election year how the Democrats have overplayed their hand. And I think that Mitch McConnell would be ready if it went to a trial in the Senate. It's a real open question as to whether Nancy Pelosi is going to let it get there. In my mind, I feel like this whole process will be dragged out with hearing after hearing after hearing and that we won't even get to a vote on impeachment until after the election. And we only get to an impeachment vote after the election if uh, the Democrats control the House after Donald Trump is defeated or – real. well, sorry. Donald Trump would have to win, but the the Democrats kept the House in order for a vote to happen in the House of Representatives. Nancy Pelosi would have to still be Speaker of the House, or I suppose somebody else could be and pursue impeachment. But – if Donald Trump was defeated, then uh, clearly there's no reason for there to be any kind of a vote. It just wouldn't happen. And the thing that's crazy about impeachment is uh, we just we really don't impeach for things that matter. It's like George W. Bush wasn't impeached for lying people into the Iraq War, and that was pretty blatant and brazen. And there was so much evidence there for going after someone, and the Democrats don't do it. Because they know that the GOP will find ways to impeach Democratic presidents. So it's kind of like an informal detente between the two political parties. And I think up to this point, it's mostly held. Our, our politics have broken. And I think that now it's almost not even worth it to try to maintain that kind of informal agreement. Because I think the GOP would be the first to break it. So, you know, in my head, I think... As a voter myself, I don't actually have a problem with Democrats backing impeachment. Um, I don't think that there's a problem. I think what matters is what are the contents of those articles of impeachment. So if you can persuade me as a citizen that there are strong reasons to remove Donald Trump from office, then I'm going to be for it. I don't have an aversion to impeachment as a tool. There's a lot of people who get paid really big money to go on TV and – they constantly whine and um, go on and on about how, like, well, uh, I don't know that we should do this to a president. It will divide us up more. And we're pretty right. divided right now. Like, I, I mean, yeah, we look exactly. around, like, what are we? How are we going to get more divided? I mean, people are people are basically so at each other's throats that they're talking about like. How can you get Twitter to ban the president? And like, how can you get? <laughs> How can I find a way to like block you so I don't have to see you, what you're saying and stuff like that? Like, how can I remove you so that you're not in my space? And I don't see how you could get more divided. So I think like as far as the thing of people who are centrists who just feel like this isn't the way to go and then everyone's like, oh, will we survive this? Will our republic survive an impeachment? I just think that like that's really kind of uh, hyperbolic in the sense of can this republic survive an impeachment? I mean, if we remove a president from office, it's what we have to do. And Donald Trump is unlike almost anyone that's ever occupied the White House. It seems like if you were going to impeach a president, it might be for Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I I couldn't uh, agree more. Uh, uh, Kevin so eloquently put there. Uh, and, and so many salient points. I, I don't even really know. Uh, th there's not much I can add to that. But um, just uh, r number one, like you said, I, 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 this this issue of impeachment. I, I think um, we have this. Uh, you know, people are, are like you said. Oh, we, we divide the nation. I mean, number one, Donald Trump is already uh, on on Twitter talking about how it's it's you know it's like the civil war. Um, you know, like that's the that's the level of division that that he's talking about. Um, you know, a violent conflict that killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. Yeah, and um, Pierce, you know, the reaction of Democrats is to go, "How dare he invoke a civil war? I've been to a civil war. I've seen dead people." Yeah, I know. And, I, and I'm like, that just takes it to even more insanely stupid level. I know. I I, I saw those tweets, and it was just like. Really? Like this is this is you know again it's like this is the 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 level of decorum. I mean they're just as bad as he is. I this oh I've been to a civil war. It's like what what is it supposed to like win you points or something like that? You know it, it, that's also this like uh 
um, you know, I, I can't stand it when it's like uh, people, you know, debating, uh, well, you know, well, this genocide is worse than that genocide or this, you know, this civil war was actually worse than that one. It's like, what are you nuts? I mean, these are people's lives. Um, but, you know, th- this sort of casual um, nature with which they talk about this. But that, you know, even the, this whole question of like civil war and violence, I mean, that brings me to this other this thing that you, you were mentioning earlier. I mean, the we, we don't impeach presidents for committing things like war crimes. There's no doubt that the, the Bush administration lied completely about Iraq. I mean, you know, leaving aside, I mean, what may or may have been missed, you know, on purpose about 9-11. Um, but, you know, just, just looking at Iraq, I mean, they lied about that. Millions of people died because of those lies. We allow presidents the authority uh, to assassinate really whomever they want. There's, there's no trials. There's no, you know, lawyers, uh, to, you know, uh, filing motions to stop assassinations. I mean, if the president deems that, that someone is a terrorist, well, they can drone them or shoot them or poison them or uh, rendition them to some black site in a country we, we don't even know where it is and torture them for the rest of their life. I mean, how that's not impeachable or, or how that doesn't rise to the occasion of we should remove this person from office is shocking. Um, whereas, like you said, I mean, it, 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 this could turn into an issue of, well, we don't like Donald Trump uh, being so brash uh, talking to Zelensky, who I, I like to that you point out, I mean, it's sort of like a, a D-list celebrity in Ukraine as well. Um, so, you know, it's so just the interesting there, the, the happenstance of that. But yeah, I mean, the, these sort of things, that's never brought into the equation. That's that's not really important. Um, I, I think this sort of shows the insanity of all this. And yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you. I'm I'm fine with impeachment as a a uh, I don't know like a check on on the president. That's fine. But let's actually use it the right way. Um, you know, let's not uh, or, uh, because it's also it's just where does this leave us? I mean, it just it does seem like. If this if this fails, which it's entirely likely that it could, they will all but ensure that Donald Trump will get another term. And then we're going to hear nothing for the next four years other than how good he won the election and how he beat impeachment. Um, you know, while he continues to allow all of his uh, friends and the sycophants around him to enrich their own lives uh, at the you know cost of uh, – everybody else uh and, and and nothing really changes um except for and also just the, the sort of like the more radical politics that that you're beginning to see break into the mainstream being marginalized once again so i mean it, it's almost it like almost kind of like freaks me out to the to the level of like is this like is this part of the democrats thing it's like we have to maintain the status quo so much that we're going to torpedo <laughs> you know, uh, getting rid of him in order to make maintain that, you know, the banks and the, uh, you know, aerospace companies and all these other things are happy. I know that that's a kind of cynical um, and maybe it's like a little bit too extreme, but I really do wonder about that. And and then also just very quickly, and I'll throw it to you uh, for, for your thoughts, but, you know, uh, you were mentioning too this Mitch McConnell might um, go forward with a trial. But like you said, he can make that trial into whatever he wants to. And also, I mean, do are the Democrats really willing to open up that possibility? Because what if what if Mitch McConnell is like, OK, well, you know, you've impeached him based on him going after Hunter Biden. Let's call in Hunter Biden. You know, let's 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 subpoena all of his emails of that he had with uh, Barisma Holdings. I mean, are we are, are they so confident that this cokehead, um, you know, uh, you know, college flunky, um, who just is so lucky to be, you know, the the the, the son of the vice president? Are we sure there's no skeletons in his closet? Are we? A- are they absolutely certain that there wasn't something shady going on with him in, in Ukraine? I mean, I I that seems. Like a very bold assertion, unless you're right. Maybe this is just they're going to drag him out or I don't know. I mean, do you think Nancy Pelosi like that? Maybe there is something more to this or, or is that just uh, 
is that just me kind of uh, just sort of pulling something out of my ass? No, I think that it's you know it's not a great sequel, but it's kind of like a <laughs> sequel to the Clinton Foundation discussion that we had. Mm. And most of the Democrats would say there's really nothing to see here. It's all just conspiracy theories pumped by the right wing echo chamber, the media websites. You've got Breitbart.com. You've got uh, the Blaze. You've got other places that are just going on and on about the Clinton Foundation. And there was a book that was put out and it was published. I think it was called Clinton Cash. And yeah, the, New York yeah. Times, the New York Times uh, published a, a whole thing giving this author uh, the ability to push the allegations that were within the book. And I think some of them were thinly sourced. Some of them were worth digging into and exploring, in my opinion. And you know, it was how are the, the the money related to Clinton and raising money for these AIDS initiatives and everything, the money that was being used to raise uh, to help out Haiti. How was that being doled out? What was it doing to enrich certain people? It seems like something that should be investigated. And, of course, most of the people who are Clinton Democrats, as I, I, I colloquially call them, because I think that's a good way of identifying their centrism, that these Clinton Democrats basically said, you know, I, how dare you? How dare you look at what the foundation, it's a philanthropic foundation. How could you right. look at what they're doing? Um, and I think that that's what, so, uh, let me just confess to something. I think we're coming to the end of this hour. So I just mm -hmm. want to talk about something journalistic wise, like about what I have to deal with as a person on a daily basis. And, uh, Please. I suppose, I suppose I'm going to make this podcast about me for a moment <laughs> because, uh, we've talked a lot of, about everything else. So now I guess we get to talk about me, but, uh, I just wanted to admit that like one of the failings that I think a lot of journalists can really fall into, and and I think you might have felt this way too, because of how insane everything is, that like I, I'll admit that oftentimes I'll just find myself like throwing my hands up and laughing when Donald Trump has done something stupid and horrible, because as that stupid and horrible thing unfolds, You've got Democrats that are responding in just as silly and stupid ways. So it almost makes it like impossible to find your way into addressing what's going on. And you just, you, I think I just sit back and hope that it'll go away. It's like mm -hmm. maybe this tit for tat between Trump and Democrats will just end. Maybe it won't, maybe it'll end here. Maybe, and I think the impeachment inquiry almost effectively means that we're going to be talking about the Ukraine call next year and and for the coming months and i don't know if i really want that um i don't have a choice i'll have to engage in it anyway because as a journalist it's important to continue to follow the issues and what's happening but it's really frustrating because you want to find your way into addressing something that donald trump did and then the democrats respond and you look at it and you go Gosh, it's almost like even worse than what Donald Trump has done. <laughs> and then you find yourself trapped because there's just so much that you have to tackle. And then to speak to the average citizen, I mean, you find yourself just hating both sides. And I think that can make you feel like you want to just disengage entirely. I think the trouble here is that, like, in order to speak to people going into 2020, which is really what impeachment leads into and what it's all about, is that it's important to keep a perspective when we're talking about impeachment. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell Democrats what they should do or not do because they're going to do whatever. I really don't – I think it's pointless for me to publish an op-ed and be like, Democrats should focus on the Ukraine call. <laughs> it's very tidy and clean. That's just not the kind of – that's not my style as a journalist. But what I do think is important is informing people that – uh what is performing well out there right now is that people really just want to see certain policies be put into place that can improve their lives materially. And I think the one downfall, the one serious downfall of impeachment in the end could be that people get away as Democratic voters. They get away from the thing that they should be most concerned about that made Donald Trump president in the first place which is that he was able to speak to these working class grievances and use it in order to give his elitist campaign this veneer that he somehow cared about the common man. Mm -hmm. And he was able to act, even if it was a poor, 
performance that didn't deserve any kind of an Oscar or anything. But like he was able to make people believe that he was on their side and that he was an outsider and that he was not part of government. And the reason why that mattered to people is because they were hurting and they wanted someone who could be their advocate. And anybody who is being nominated for the Democratic Party, if they aren't a convincing advocate for the people that can speak on their behalf as president of the United States come 2020, they're going to lose to Donald Trump. And the reason they're going to lose to Donald Trump is because people would rather stick with what they know than take the risk on something that they do not know. And if you tell people that they can vote for change and it gives them uncertainty, they might say no. But if they know Donald Trump and it's the evil that they know, we can put it in that terms, it's the evil that they know, there just might be uh, 51% of Americans who stick with the evil that they know because they fear something far worse could come along. Brilliant, brilliant analysis there, Kevin. Uh, you know, I mean, the, uh, particularly – uh, when you're talking there about this, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the fact that, you know, Donald Trump uh, was able to, you know, use this veneer of, uh, you know, working class populism and stuff in order to mask, obviously, the, the further corporate takeover of America and how, you know, that the Democrats could again, once again, be kind of doing this. And, and I totally know what you mean, um, you know, talking from a journalistic standpoint where it's just like, what the fuck? You know, it's like you just throw your hands up and you're like, no, they, they did. They, did the Democrats really say this? Is this really what they're adding to the conversation? Um, and, you know, it's almost like with this particular thing, it's like almost like let the whistleblower blow the whistle. You know, let's see what happens out of that. Not, oh, oh let's impeach him based on that. You know, it's like, why are you why are you adding that in, uh, you know, to this conversation? You're only making it worse. But. We are just out of time. We've got uh, just about two minutes left. And, uh, Kevin, I wanted to uh, give you the final word. And also, uh, please let the listeners know where they can go to uh, read your work and support you as well. Yeah, well, the final word that I'll say uh, very quickly here is let's just keep a focus on the fact that there is a war on whistleblowers in government. So no Mm. matter the politics of impeachment, do not forget that there are important aspects to what is happening, that what is going on right now that you should care about in terms of how whistleblowers are under attack every single day. There are people, I know this to be true, inside the Trump administration right now that have acts of corruption they want to reveal but are afraid to do so because they know it'll be the end of their career, potentially the end of their livelihood. And also they know that if they were going to do it right, they would have to go to the press and it would mean that they would probably be prosecuted. My website is at shadowproof.com, shadowproof.com. Uh, my podcast is Unauthorized Disclosure. You can find me on Twitter at Kagastola. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. And um, uh, please go and check out shadowproof.com. Uh, you also have a Patreon as well. We'll link up to that in the show notes. I want to thank my guest, Kevin Gastola, for joining us on the show. Uh, I want to thank all of you for listening, and I'll be talking to you all very soon. Thank you.